On this episode of NorCal News Now, we're speaking with Butte County Supervisor Candidate Tammy Ritter. I'm your host, Mike Richmond. And I'm political consultant, Aaron Haar. Are you a political consultant today? You're not Politico, you're not politics dude. No, actually, you're not hat wearing I'm just, Aaron. I'm just public. I'm representing the public, I guess. Public superhero Aaron Haar. Yes. I like that. Speaking okay. of that, Obama, you know, the the biggest role in government, mm-hmm. citizen. Ah, so you go. Well, you are that, man. Well, you so are you. Are I, I got to appreciate everybody who's worked on this show. You know, I don't know if people know, you know, we work 40, 50, 60 hour weeks yep. and, and still, you know, come here and get this done. And Do it for the love. As citizens. That's right. Yep. Responsible. That's, right. That's right. Well, thank you for that, Aaron. Well, we're going to turn to our guest because we had a good one today. Uh, our guest on the show is a longtime Butte County resident who has served the community for nearly 20 years as the founding member of the Chico Sustainability Task Force. Uh, task force, I should say, a board member of the Chico Housing Improvement Program and a stint on the Chico City Council. Now, she's running for Butte County Supervisor in District 3. Tammy Ritter, welcome to NorCal News Now. Thanks. Happy I, to be here. Yeah. Did I get that all right? You got it all right. Uh, along with a lot of other stuff. You've, well, you've a lot had, of other stuff as you, well. You've had quite an active active public career. I have. It's really been amazing in the, in the what, the, the 20 years or not even 20 years, I think. That a little more than 20. Yeah. It's incredible that you've done all that. Um, so in all that wealth of experience that I just mentioned, uh, highlighted, um, what was the motivation for you to get into public service uh, You know, in the late 90s? It was more about... Um, I was working in the social services Mm -hmm. and seeing what that connection was um, to the local government when I was working at Catalyst, directing their home, their shelter. Um, It was when I, that's when I joined the homeless task force and realized what an issue we had in our community without having an emergency shelter. Uh, We had people who would call the crisis line and pretend to be in domestic violence relationships because it was the only shelter that was available. And that really highlighted the need for me. Um, And Also, the Catalyst House was owned by the city of Chico. And so I worked really closely with what was then called housing and community development. Mm -hmm. Um, Then as the founding director of the Torres Community Shelter, we worked really close with the city um, when we were ready to build um, our building. The the land came from the city of Chico. When we were using our emergency use permits, that was granted by the city. That's when we were rotating shelter. And so there was just a a direct tie-in. And, um, and that's what got me interested in um, being on the other side of the desk, so yeah. to speak. A lot, of, a lot of really great, great uh, uh, causes there. Catalyst is one that I know really well. Yeah. Really great, great uh, group of people doing great work in the community. Um, and what do you think about, I mean, you know, so you were involved uh, at a young age. Obviously, you were like eight, I think, uh, yeah. 20 years ago. Maybe 12. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, getting involved, I mean, that was really before we see so many women involved now. I mean, it's really incredible, the, the wave of women that we've seen get involved in politics. Yeah. But you were really well before that. So, I mean, you know, you, you talk about what you motivated you to kind of move from social services into politics. Was that kind of a, I don't want to say scary, was it a bit of a leap for you was to, to actually go to an elected position eventually? I don't think it was too big of a leap. Um, I remember when I was hired for the, um, the director of the Torres Shelter, Colleen Jarvis was on my board at the time. Mm-hmm. And... She sat down with me and she said, okay, we're going to write this grant. You know, we're going to write it to the federal government. And then she said, okay, go. And I, <laughs> I was like, I've never written a grant before. I don't know what I'm doing. What are you talking about? And she just said, just, just do it. Just, you know, follow the directions and mm-hmm. write the grant. Mm-hmm. And I thought, wow, is this how it's done? Like mm-hmm. people just decide they're going to do something and then they do it. And that was Colleen's approach was like, you know, kind of throw her into the pool. <laughs> and so... Um, yeah, so I didn't really have any question that I was going to be capable of it after that. It was I thought, well, if I can write a grant without having any idea what I'm doing and it's successful and gets funded, then, um, you know, I can learn how to do anything. And so, yeah, yeah I think it's more about the energy you put into it. And the empowerment of that. You think about that. I mean, that was, you know, what a great mentor to have in Colleen Jarvis. Yeah. Great color. You know, I mean, and you think about, you know, how that influenced your life, I'm sure, to, to this day. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, you know, if it had been somebody else, maybe you don't have the same path going forward. Perhaps. I mean, it's funny, you know, for you to say mentor because, mm-hmm. you know, that's that's a very unique uh, methodology of mentorship. 
like, go do it, you know, <laughs> where I'm looking Sink for somebody to kind of walk me through it. Right. And yeah, so. Um, but you've handled budgets. You've handled very mm-hmm. large, uh, yes. substantial budgets, yes. you know, and that's something that uh, I think served you well in, mm-hmm. in your work with the city, uh, getting that fiscal uh, direction going the right way and um, certainly did your job there and turning things around and, you know, credit credit to you for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, it's good experience. Some tough decisions. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, good experience. I mean, for what you've done. I mean, uh, of course, being on the Chico City Council and now running for Butte, Butte uh, County Supervisor, that's great experience running those types of budgets and having to organize those types of projects. Absolutely. So were those things that you, you, you think about now and that you take away from those experiences and, and think about while you're you know, trying to figure out where to trim or what to, what you want to do? It's definitely different looking at the, at the, the ways that the budgets are presented. Mm-hmm. So- Um, with the city, there was, the city had control over its whole budget. Whereas with the county, a lot of the funding that comes from the federal government, it's, it's already, it's already in the categories it's going to be in. There's not a huge amount that the board of supervisors has discretion over in terms of kind of changing categories or changing line items. Um, but, but it's very different in terms of the services that are offered because with the city, you know, we were, we're, we're looking at things like police and fire and, and then road maintenance and parks and trees and things like that. Whereas with the County, there really is a service component. It's public health and it's behavioral health and it's department of employment and social services. Mm -hmm. And, and all of the, um, the you know, the United D- Domestic Workers, the IHSS mm-hmm. folks and- Continuum of care. And, right, all yeah. of that, um, you know, that's very different from what the city does. And so that's the part that I feel um, the most excited about because it seems like there are ways to directly impact people. Mm-hmm. Well, I think we're getting a taste of it already. You are, uh, I can say, I think you wouldn't object to this. You're a wonk. You're a policy wonk. It, <laughs> I don't know it, about that. It sounds like. Um, <laughs> and, and we like to talk about the policy and the issues because I think it's important. It's important to serve the, the audience with those because those are the questions people have. Mm-hmm. But we also want to kind of get to know you and get to know the, the person behind the candidate who's out there working hard and, and on the stump and, and running for office. So with that in mind, I wonder if you can maybe tell me if there's a person that you can think of, first person that jumps in your head, political figure, past or present, that you really admire, that you look at, you say, wow, that, that person is really somebody that I think either did it right or is doing it right right now that I would seek to emulate as a public servant. <laughs> can I say Bobby Kennedy? Nah, sure. You can say whoever <laughs> yeah, you <absolutely>. want. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, that's really hard. Um I was working with somebody earlier in the campaign season and they were telling me because I was saying it's so hard to come up with this like two minute speech introduction or these, you know, these kind of stump speeches. And she said, well, listen to people that you think are doing it right. Mm -hmm. And um, and I did. So I listened to a lot of speeches and and I realized that there was there was really no one that I felt like I could emulate without feeling really artificial. Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. it didn't feel authentic. And I thought, well, if I stumble and if I'm not quite as polished as, as I wish I were, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm I'm not running for governor. I'm not, mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm not running for president. So, but, but there's an authenticity there. I mean, you know, we've seen that in the last election cycle in 2016, where we had a a man who's now our president, who, you know, I mean, for all of his flaws. Oh, uh, man, you're not comparing me to Trump. No, are you? no, okay, no, I'm just making sure. no. But what I, what I'm saying <laughs> is is we've seen that 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 the game of politics has changed. I think. Where I think the the people uh, and maybe I'm comparing you to Trump a little bit in no, a certain way, that. but <laughs> what I'm saying is 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 that maybe people don't want the overly polished, buffed out messages that are are just four or five talking points. Maybe they want to hear what the person is authentically and what they actually believe. I mean, are you seeing that? Are people asking you those kind of questions when you're meeting with them? Um, well, I know we've done a lot of different forums, mm-hmm. and I would say that. You know, some of those those forums have a particular lean to mm-hmm. them, and you know, you can you can tell when your answer to a question goes over, and you can tell when your answer to a question falls flat. Mm-hmm. And um, for me, it's really just practicing not being attached to whatever that that outcome is. If that if this is what I believe, then this is what I'm going to say, 
and <laughs> hopefully that's going to resonate with voters. And you know, and if there's something that I need to, if there's something I need to change because I don't have all the information, then I'm going to. That I is, mean, is, from a political consultant point of view, the most important thing for candidates is authenticity of course. and consistency. Yeah, mm -hmm. and. I don't know. You may not be wrong about the the Trump thing. I mean, oh my gosh! This I'm sorry. Is, I'm sorry, a, Tammy, but it is absolutely. No, 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 I, I, think, <laughs> I think Trump's inauthentic. So, but I would say that those are the two combinations that, uh, as far as uh, a consulting side, that I like to look for in candidates: yeah. authenticity yeah. and consistency in that. And um, you know, there's candidates that can do one or the other, but. Um, well, and I think the voters, uh, you know, I think the voters know the difference. I think that that these really very plastic, uh, prepackaged um, candidates who, you know, never really seem to say anything. You know, even when a media person will ask them a question, a really good direct question, mm -hmm. where anyone sitting at home listening to that would say, "Yeah, give us a direct answer," and they're like, "Well, you know, you can look at it." You know, and they you start getting the mm -hmm. the the. The wavering and the, the kind speech. of waffling and the double speak <laughs> yeah. and all this stuff, and then you're like, you come out, you come away from it, you're like, well, who is that person? You know, why well, don't want to vote for somebody? I mean, I think they represent this kind of. Maybe they got a D next to their name or an R next to their name, so I guess. But there's no passion to there to that, you know. And you talked about being not being attached to outcome, um, which is very zen, by the way. Thank you for doing that. Uh, <laughs> um, but I mean, you know, I think that I think that. As voters, I think we we have to understand the process for what it is, and have to understand that we we get the candidates that we support and push for. Mm -hmm. And if we want authenticity, we have to accept people who are willing to be authentic on the campaign trail. Mm -hmm. And you you I mean I've seen you a couple of times at various events. You're very I mean you are who you, I mean you talk about consistency. You are who you are every time I've seen you. Um, and I would think I would hope that that would translate into being a Butte County supervisor. I hope so too. You know, I mean, people, <laughs> people are voting for you based on what they're hearing now. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I mean, you know, because again, you've had a stand on the city, Chico City Council. I mean, are there times where you, you run on something, not even you necessarily, but just the general, the royal we, the mm -hmm. royal you, you run on something and you, you, you have a, a position, then the reality of doing the job, you're like, well, yeah, I, I have to kind of vote in a, maybe a slightly different way based on other factors or, or changing factors. Well, uh, that's a really good question. So one of the things that I said um, when I was running for council was, you know, people would always ask, what are you going to do for us? Like, you know, what are the what are the campaign promises you're going to make? And I would say, I can't make any promises because you need a majority of votes. So if there aren't three other counselors that agree with me on this issue, there's literally nothing I can promise you other than I'm going to show up, I'm going to do the work, and I'm going to, you know, advocate for these values that I've been talking about. Um, in terms of, you know, things that I had to, you know, maybe go a different direction, I think the biggest kind of surprise on council was the budget. Um, because prior to 2012, when I was elected, the kind of the, the line from the city was, we can't give you the budget this way, or you're not going to understand it. And literally, there was no budget. We had no idea how bad a financial shape the city was in. And then when the financial folks were let go and, you know, there was a complete restructuring, then we got a sense of what we were looking at and the huge deficits and, you know, that we were in the red and we had no emergency reserves. And so I think from a priority standpoint, I definitely, um, that was, that was the biggest shock it was like, well, this is the first thing we have to take care of no matter what I think about housing and all of these other things, this is, if we don't have money, we don't have a city and, you know, we didn't want to be the next city declaring bankruptcy. So it definitely shifted my focus a little bit. Um, but I'll also say that the folks who are the most supportive and the folks that want to get you into office, they're the ones that are usually the most disappointed with you and the most vocal about it. Um, but once you're elected, you don't just represent the people who got you elected. You re represent everyone. And well, I mean, you know, I, I know the way that I look at a candidate. I don't vote for a candidate based necessarily on their positions. I vote for a candidate based on who I think that person is. And mm -hmm. because I understand that you get into the job and realities change. Like you say, budgets come up short. You know, things change. Mm -hmm. um, 
But the values of somebody, the person that they are is what they bring with them into the job. And I want that. And I want to understand what that is. Because if I trust that person, I say, well, you're going to make this decision on my my behalf. And you're going to make them in a way that I I trust and I respect. Hopefully that happens. You know, Mm -hmm. that should be what the process is all about. Right. Um, This dance between the the voters and, and their elected officials is... And I almost think sometimes that we have unrealistic expectations of those that are our public servants because you're not, I mean, you can't leap over tall buildings in a single bound. I mean, you're a person, you know, you're a person with concerns too. And you've got to do what you think is best all the time. But yeah, there's realities there that, that maybe don't, don't allow you to do what, what you want to do all the time. Like mm-hmm. budgets are a good, good example of that. Yeah. I think. And I also, I think one of the things I didn't really understand before I was on council was that sometimes people vote for things that they don't agree <laughs> with um, simply because they know it's going to pass. They know the other votes are there. And so they will vote in accordance with the direction the vote's going because you can only bring an item back and re-agendize it if you're on the prevailing side of a vote. And that was a really a <laughs> big surprise for me that people actually just voted that way so that they could be the one to bring it back and say, I think we need to relook at this. Saw that strategy in yeah. place the other night, I think. Uh, but that's it's very parliamentary of you. I mean, it's not only democratic, but it's very parliamentary, a procedure of you to just let it go and move on to the next thing once that's done. That's It's probably a really very hard thing to do. Oh, you know? yeah, I would imagine, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. But, reality of it. but that is the, the procedure, and that is, the, you know, the democracy had played out, and now you move on. Um, and that's the best you can do, you know, and fight fight for that discussion and try to sway the votes. But uh, at the end of the day, you got to accept how how the you know dem- democratic process played out. Yeah, it's it's messy. I mean, the, the, you know, our system was intentionally designed to be messy. I think. I mean, I look at I look <laughs> at the Constitution, for instance, and I, I look at it as a system system thinker. Right? You're like. This is kind of convoluted. I mean, this isn't really a, a system that's designed to move forward easily. Oh, it's absolutely set mm-hmm. up to be difficult. But that's okay. I mean, I think that's the point. I mean, it's you like know, a safeguard. It is. And the founding yeah. fathers maybe could never envision a, a, a country where there'd be 325 or whatever it is, million people. But the complexity of it um, actually, in a certain sense, helps with larger numbers because there's going to always be dissatisfied people within that messy system, even in a small town or a small mm-hmm. county yeah. like Chico or Butte County. I mean, you're not going to get everything you want all the time. And I think I, I, my personal belief is that most voters don't understand that. I think most voters don't understand that there's compromises that have to be made. And especially now, I think we're really in a danger point with this yep. where people are saying, no, no, no I, I, I'm going to vote for somebody who's a progressive. I'm going to vote for somebody who's conservative. And I'm going to hold their feet to the fire and they better do what I want them to do all the time. And if they don't, I vote them the heck out of there. That's not the way the system is set up. It's not the way it works in Washington or in, in, in Butte County or anywhere. But for those voters who want to hear about issues. <laughs> yeah. Well, and let's be specific. You're running for District yep. two, uh, district 3, district I'm three. sorry. Yeah. And that that is in, some of it is in Chico and some of it is unincorporated or in, outside the area. Um, so, I mean, if you live in Chico, you still need to vote for a county supervisor. Mm-hmm. But you won't just be representing that area. That's who votes for you. You'll be representing all of the county and, right. and Oroville and, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, um, Paradise and these mm-hmm. different things. So um, so let's get into some of, some of the things. What are, what are some of the issues that, you know, not only this district that you're in, but the whole county are facing and, and what do you want to tackle? So water is the first thing um, that I think... You know, everyone's kind of becoming aware of it right now. And I think particularly in this election cycle, it's a it's kind of the big the big topic. Um, And it's coinciding right now with the county's sustainable groundwater management plan. Driven by the state. yeah. Driven by the state. And basically what the state is saying is either you come up with your system of governance or we're going to do it for you. And of course, we don't want that to happen. Um, We see what happens when the state You've been into water for a while. You've served on water boards um, um, throughout. So one of the things Maureen Kirk said about you, Maureen Kirk, who held your seat for how many? 12 years. 12 years. And now she's retiring. One of the things she said about you that you just actually might be possibly a better representative than her. And what a glowing compliment. And it was because of the water, not only the water, but the fiscal conservativeness. But one thing she said is that you're, you know, you would really know your way around uh, 
out of all the things water around here. So, so I would say um, that Maureen is being kind. Um, <laughs> the, I think the topic of water is so it's so huge and it's so much bigger um, than I can understand. But since I was um, and and before even I was elected to city council. I started meeting um, with local agencies and organizations that work specifically in water. And while I was on council, we had a minimum of once a month where I would meet with Maureen and would meet with um, representatives from Aqua Alliance to find out what was happening and um, you know what kind of lawsuits were moving forward and what kind of lawsuits were going to make it and um, you know looking at the 10-year transfer plans and all of these things you know looking at the twin tunnels before the twin tunnels were the twin tunnels and um, you know the idea of ground underground storage and surface storage and things like that so so I feel like I've been getting an education on it for a lot of years and I feel like there is still a ton to know and if if somebody's coming at it from a like a single focus, like simply from an agricultural perspective, I, I don't think that's going to give our county the balance that we need. And I'm pushing hard because right now, you know, there's there's large farmers, there's small farmers, there's um, the small farmers, you know, under 50 acres or what they're calling individual mm -hmm. uh, well users, um, and then county representative and city representative. And I want to see I want to see an environmental represent. I want to see a. I want to see a Tuscan Aquifer representative, right? Like I want to see somebody who was there just to speak for the groundwater and for the surface water, and to, you know, to be the voice for the people who drink the water and for, you know, every one of us in the city that is dependent upon this aquifer. Yeah, the Sustainability Groundwater Management Act. I mean. It Butte County is a huge groundwater area. I mean, we have mm -hmm. surface water places, but especially your district would be mm -hmm. the seat at the table of we are groundwater users, whether you're a farmer, whether you're, you know, uh, a, a, a private entity or an organization or whether you're a homeowner. So basically the state said, hey, you've got to you've have till this point, to, I think it was 2017 to get your groundwater agencies together mm -hmm. i think we've done that we've been on the ball for that some places aren't uh and now we have till 22 2022 to get our groundwater plans together right. um with the end result of 2045 having sustain total sustainability mm -hmm. in the state right um and whether they're desalinating down there and taking less here but basically it really is in flux of these people who are on these committees, uh, JTA, JT, I forget what the subcommittees are going to be mm -hmm. in the ad hocs. There's going to be a lot of people involved and in getting JTAs, these getting the these powers authorities. these plans together. And really, it, it is like she said. It's like if you don't do it, well, the state's going to come in and do it for you. What kind of deal do you think you're going to get? Then? Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. and uh, for a place like this that's completely you know dependent on groundwater. Yeah, we need somebody at the table that'll that'll fight for every drop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Somebody to speak for the water. <laughs> the H two O X. The H two O X. Yeah, I think that's something that's, that's a good one. Well, that's that's one that's one of your your key mm -hmm. your key points. You have you have three things that you really were right. were talking about. Um, and that was one of them. Um, housing crisis, yeah. behavioral health. That's another one. These three all kind of really tie together um, in, in a large way. But talk about behavioral health and the housing crisis and how that relates. Right. So. You know, if you if you were to just go online and you were to go onto one of the Chico sites, you know, rants or raves or, you know, some of the ones that talk about what's happening in town, um, the the perspective that you would walk away from, you know, Chico with would just, in my opinion, be incredibly negative. Um, there's kind of this narrative that's happening throughout the city and throughout the county that. Um, you know, homelessness is rampant here and that, um, you know, it has taken over the city and it's different here than it is anywhere else. And the reality is, is that we're seeing this increase in homelessness across the nation. This has more to do with poverty than it has to do with anything else. We don't have available housing stock, right? We've got less than 1% vacancies in any of our rentals and we don't have the housing for people. And so, 
I think our county is in a crisis, just like I think a lot of counties are in crisis. And I think it's going to take a lot better coordination between the cities and the county because the county is the entity that is administering the, the continuum of care. And we have the organizations involved in the continuum of care that we need to have. We have the right players at the table. But what we don't have is very good coordination between the cities, between the city and the county. And then we have cities like Chico that are kind of going rogue, right? And they're, they're passing these ordinances that criminalize homelessness. And they have been proven to be ineffective. They have been proven to cost the jurisdictions that pass the money. You know, it costs the money. And, and yet we still have them. And there's still people fighting for them. And, and then that costs us money as well when the continuum of care, you know, the housing and urban development says, no, we're going to we're going to ding you and you're going to you're going to lose fifty thousand mm. dollars as long as you have these kinds of ordinances on the books. The Chico Police Department um, contracted with Chico State to do an evaluation of the sit lie ordinance. You know about that? No. Yeah. No. And, um, and I two, imagine it didn't do much. To two, help, well, but... two PhDs from Chico State. Um, they did the evaluation and they got all the numbers and Chico PD provided everything. And sure enough, it didn't work and it cost the money. It was ineffective. If only we'd known, right? Um, and a lot of services <laughs> lost money because of that right. from the continuum of care. Right. Um, cause you kind of, kind of, it's, you kind of got to go along with what the, what the state is telling you and right. to have that sort of. You know, yeah, I, I I didn't think it was going to work when it came out. I thought there was probably better solutions uh, that could be put on the table, but I think they wanted to try it. I hope they can acknowledge that it hasn't done much to to solve the problem. But even more so, what it's done is made that community or made that that group even more um, kind of put off and even more in in dire uh, oh, yeah. need to where. <laughs> Some of them have have kind of gone to the of okay, this is a disrespectful tone I'm getting, so I might as well be disrespectful back. So if I don't have a community that cares about me, so well, I, and I almost wonder if if from a conservative viewpoint that it's not even about the solution. It's not even about really coming up with a solution. It's about I hate to even say this, but it's more about scoring political points and having the constituents say yes, you know, we want you to do this and so do it, yeah, even though in, 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 in some place in their in their soul in their heart those council members would say this isn't going to work it's going to cost us money but it's going to be good for me politically with my base so i'm going to do it i mean that kind of stuff happens right yeah i also think that i think a lot of it has to do with um people's sort of moral objections to things you know and we walk down the street we see somebody who's laying on a sidewalk or you know clearly disenfranchised in some way yeah. and it does not make us feel good makes us feel uncomfortable and there is there's judgments that come up and i feel like the the folks that are pushing for these ordinances what they're pushing for is to not have to see this i don't want to have to see this i don't want to have to confront it i don't want to deal with this uncomfortable feeling that every time i'm walking to starbucks to get my triple foam whatever, whatever. you know that i have to i have to see this person who clearly has nothing and there's this idea that if people would just work hard, then they could change their situation. And so clearly that individual is not working hard, right? If And it's like a moral failing. Yeah. And so I think that, I think that's what's being perpetuated because when we hear things like the community court that was being proposed, um, it was not modeled in a traditional community court manner. They were talking about you know, we're going to hold people accountable, right. right? And if we're talking about people who have behavioral health issues, what what does that look like? So you're going to cite this individual who has just gone to the bathroom outside or cannot behave appropriately in a public setting, and you're going to now assign them community service, right. and then you're going to pay somebody to supervise that community. Like, how is that going to benefit our community? It's it's completely it's a completely backwards way of thinking. It's not about accountability with that individual. It's about getting them hooked up with the services they need. And you know, if it's if it's something criminal, then that's probably something for the regular courts, mm -hmm. right? Not these what they're calling quality of life crimes. I mean, you work in behavioral uh, health and services, and and 
I mean, you deal in the courtroom a lot. I mean, I, I imagine with, with a, a lot of different things. So you understand the, uh, even some of the legal side of this is, you know, what, what is doable, what isn't. And I, I guess what I'm trying to say is with, with, um, every situation is kind of different, you know, and to just link it all into homelessness. I mean, mm -hmm. we have veterans, right. we have, uh, people who, who suffer from addiction and, mm -hmm. and, right. and, you and know, no rehabilitation facilities. Exactly. We, we have one of the highest per capita alcohol <laughs> places in Chico. And I mean, mm -hmm. not to knock it because a lot of people don't live here for that reason or, or anything. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of comes with the territory of, mm -hmm. of the school. But, but there is an alcohol problem here, but there's no place to get help. I mean, unless you have ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 in your pocket, mm -hmm. uh, you could be a drug addict on the street and you could wake up tomorrow and you could say, I want help today. And you will be denied services anywhere you go because they can't help you. We don't, we don't have a detox center here. And that's where she, you know, Tammy talks about the relationship between the, the city and the county of the city thinks the county should pay for the detox center and have it in the county. And the county says, well, you're the city and you have the stuff. So there's just this back and forth of nobody really wants to do it. Nobody wants to take action. So the solutions we're getting, yeah, they're not going to take care of the problem. Well, and then you have the not in my backyard situation mm -hmm. which is a yeah. huge thing fear you what know? you don't understand well yeah i mean you know i know that the folks at sustainability village are, are uh mm -hmm. are, 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 simplicity yeah, simplicity, simplicity I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah i was, I was mistaken <laughs> um are, i've talked about that is that mm -hmm. the real real issue is that you know there there's there's available there there's places available that they could they could create this this community mm -hmm. which would really i mean it's not a lot of of beds necessarily in that um in that model, but it helps, mm -hmm. and they can move people through that through the system a little bit better. Get them some services, yep. but there's a there's a what they call the NIMBY, right? Not in my backyard yep. issue going on with a lot of folks. Yeah, I mean, think about the Torres shelter. Yeah. When when we got that, we the first house that uh, the Torres shelter put, a, you know, back when it was called Chico Community Shelter Partnership that they put a bid on was down in the college area. It was like an old frat house. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, they were pretty much, you know, laughed out of the room. No way were they going to sell to them, right? Because nobody wanted that service in their area. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the tourist shelter ended up moving into a, you know, light manufacturing commercial you area. You see it with other things too, though. I mean, in, in affordable housing world, you'll see it with Section 8. Like, right. I don't, I don't want thing. those people here. I don't Same want thing. that here. Uh, even people, even self- 12-step meetings even on Even self-help homes of married couples that right. have jobs and, and, and a family and just want, you know, uh, uh, to have a 30-year a mortgage where they're paying into it and they have a little, little something afterwards. Um, because we really see economically how that can really you know, raise our tax base mm -hmm. and, and those, you know, they end up earning more. They end up oh, yeah. ha having that investment when they're done paying the mortgage. <laughs> and it's got like a 90% success rate. But those neighborhoods go in, they say, no, not in my backyard. You're right. Yeah. And it's, and I mean, it, you're right. The, the idea of getting housing first and getting people to, to begin to, to, to enter the, the society in a way where they, they can advance. I mean, you know, and it's hard. I mean, you know, you think about all the things that you, you don't have. I mean, using a bathroom, I mean, it's like, you know, ridiculous right. that you can't use. I mean, that's like that's like a basic human need. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, it goes up from there. I mean, not having a car, not having a, a, an ability to, to, to create a resume or to, or to even have clothes. Maybe, to receive that, mail. To receive, to receive mail. social security. Right. I mean, yeah. there's yeah. a lot of them that have social security. They're just, yeah. they don't know, you know. I tell you, man, this world's kind of hard for me sometimes. It's hard for everyone to imagine man. some people yeah. that to navigate mm -hmm. where this world has gone in the last fifty yep. to a hundred years, from a, a basically a, a needs being met pr with pretty much ease to a technological world of of you know haves and have nots, things speeding and zooming yeah. by. There's people that can't manage that. And, no, I know, um, I know. You know, it's. it's Need to be it needs to be recognized by yeah. by yeah. by more more people. Well, let, let's let, let me get to this third piece of this because this is an important one too. Is the emergency preparedness mm -hmm. thing, which um, you know I heard you speak eloquently about about the, the crisis in Oroville that we had last year, mm -hmm. which was uh, it could have been absolutely disastrous, yes, of course, and, and we know that there really wasn't a good plan evacuation plan in place. There is, I I think there is one now. Well. I think that there, I mean, there's, there have been evacuation plans. I'm not sure that, um, I'm not sure that anyone was expecting what happened with the spillway, um, 
last year. But I mean, I think that the sheriff implemented the evacuation plans as seamlessly as he possibly could have. Um, and so, yeah, I think um, I think that we have we have good emergency services in our county. Um, a lot of my concern is is about the coordination between them and the communication between them. Um, you know, when when we look at what was happening at the same time over the summer in Santa Rosa, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of folks, you know, they were on the reverse 911. Mm -hmm. But it really depended where you lived, whether you got a reverse 911 call and when dispatch was calling into the central station to say, okay, we need to put out this reverse 911 call. They had no idea because that's not the system that they used. And we have a lot of people, as many people living in the outlying rural areas as we have living in the city of Chico. And so we need to have a plan for how are those folks going to be notified? Are we going to use a siren? Are we going to, I mean, how is that going to happen? Because one of the major things that I hear about the communities such as Forest Ranch and Cohasset and out in Cherokee and, you know, further out in, um, in Thermalito is that they don't get cell coverage. Mm -hmm. And so how would they receive, if they don't have a landline, how would they receive that call? And they did a, um, a practice evacuation up in Forest Ranch a couple weeks ago that I went to, and it was amazing. Mm -hmm. They're really prepared up there. Um, and you know, in a community of, you know, <laughs> thousand plus people, um, you know, there was there was a room of less than a hundred people. And so there's, you know, there's pretty significant numbers of folks living up there. Mm -hmm. And did the others not participate because they didn't know about it? Did they not participate because they thought, okay, I've got my go bag, I'm ready to go. Um, you know, Fars Ranch has a couple different ways out. Cohasset is they're a locked community. Mm -hmm. If there's a fire on Cohasset, Cohasset Road, they're not. There's no way out. And so, so I want to know that the folks who are living in um, the more remote areas that maybe don't drive, and are maybe dependent upon somebody who comes and checks on them once or twice a week, how how are we going to be in touch with them? How, what is our plan to make sure that everyone is is taken care of? Mm -hmm. To the best of your ability. To the best of our ability, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that I think that when it comes to sheltering and supplies and things like that, we we're 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 on task and we're on point and we're doing a good job. And I think that um, that our sheriff department did a a really fantastic job. Um, but you know what they keep saying is that it's not a matter of if; it's a matter of when with the next fire. And mm -hmm. and I want to make sure that. Um, you know, that our law enforcement is ready and that our emergency services are ready and mm -hmm. all of the other kind of ancillary impacts it's going to have, right? If all of those hotel rooms are filled in Chico and all of those hotel rooms are filled in Yuba City mm -hmm. or, you know. Yeah, people were staying at the Speedway here in Chico. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that worked okay from what the reports were. I mm -hmm. mean, for being thrown together essentially at a, right. pretty quickly. I mean, and they weren't there for very long either, really, in, in right. the grand scheme of things. And people were able to get back to their homes fairly quickly. Right. Uh, and summer. they're used to that at, yeah. at, at the fairgrounds. I mean, yeah. they do that for all kinds of events mm -hmm. where they have campers come in right. and pull up right. and they have services. And mm -hmm. so it also yeah. depends how large of an evacuation area we're talking about. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about the 2016 campaign a little bit. Um, you were in a very tough fight uh, in 2016 mm -hmm. for the Chico City Council to, for your re-election bid. You, you, you did ultimately lose. It was a very, very, very close election. You lost very, very narrowly. Um, if things had gone differently, um, if you were on the Chico City Council um, and, and there there was, and again, I don't want to put too fine a point on it because I know it's a nonpartisan council, but if there was you as opposed to one of the more conservative leaning members of the council. How do you think um, this last year and a half or so uh, in, in the city of Chico would have gone? What would be, be different, do you think? Well, so the first thing I'll say is that um, that I served with all of the conservative leaning um, council members who are currently sitting mm -hmm. and, um, and had a fine working relationship <laughs> with all of them. Right, so, right. Um, yeah, so... Um, you know, I, I haven't I hadn't speculated if it had been, um, you know, you essentially know I got beat by my own team. Yeah, my right, yeah, I wouldn't say you, I wouldn't <laughs> say you lost. I mean, because Carl Ori, a, a former mm -hmm. mayor, very, mm -hmm. very popular, mm -hmm. uh, 
very popular person in, in the area, you know, ran and then. Well, what I mean, what I'm saying is, what if, what if, what if Tammy and Carl had both won seats? Well, then we would have had a majority right. on the council. Then things would be great. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. What, what would be? Oh, so I'm kind of at, running through that scenario. What? How would some of the ordinance we've seen and and some of the the ways that our our city has changed here in the last year and a half or so? Mm-hmm. How how would it be different? Do you think? Um, well, I mean, I think that there would. Um, I th- I think there would certainly be a, a leaning towards more inclusivity. Um, you know, one of the things that really surprised me. It doesn't surprise me when votes go in a certain direction when we have, you know, one majority or the other. Mm-hmm. But um, but one of the things that surprised me was um, the mayor saying that he was no longer going to do proclamations. Mm-hmm. And that was that was really disturbing to me um, because I was told it was because he did not want to do a proclamation for Transgender Awareness Week mm-hmm. or Transgender Day of Remembrance or some want something related to that. And um, I believe he did that one. He just didn't want to do any after. Yeah. Well, that, that so that one just sealed the deal. That was the last of them. Yes. Well, and, <laughs> and, and, and again, how much of that is playing to playing to the base? I mean, how much of that is, is, is... I think he genuinely didn't want to do that. Yeah. I'm not... <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't think that, um, I don't know that that's a political move necessarily. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's really sad yeah. to me, um, and it's sad to me that in 2018 we're still having to, um, you know, reinforce that we're supportive of anti-discrimination mm. ordinances and those kinds of things. To me, it seems like that should be a given, you know, in this day and age. But it's not. It's it. It really has felt, and I I don't want to I don't want to put my own political belief system on this because people on the other side will say this isn't true what I'm going to say, but it really has felt like a regressive, Mm -hmm. um, not just here in Butte County, but across the the country, a regression. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and we've lost things just in a year and a half, I think have been really precious to a lot of us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as they say, all politics is local. So it starts here, ground zero here in Chico and Butte County, uh, California. Um, So, you know, how do we besides voting, besides doing shows like this. And I mean, what, what do we do? What do we do to, to, to draw that line in the sand and say, no, these are things that are of value to us as, as human beings, uh, basic mm-hmm. dignity of people, quality of people, dignity of people that are homeless. Yeah. And I think, uh, I think yeah. you're, you're exactly right with the city council. It's getting people on the city council who represent your values. I think with the board of supervisors, it's the same thing. Mm-hmm. And Aaron, what you were saying before about, you know, once you're elected, you're not just representing the district that you represent. You know, when elected, I will represent people in Oroville and people in Paradise and people in Gridley and that that is the job. So just because you don't live in an area where that election is taking place. So, for example, in two more years, when the other three seats come up, it's critically important that people in the county right, maybe not in those districts, are supporting the candidates that they want to see holding those seats, Mm -hmm. that we are saying, okay, this is who we want representing this Oroville district, Mm -hmm. right? And this is who we want representing this Gridley district, Mm -hmm. because those people are the ones that are going to be setting policy and making decisions for Butte County. And if we don't agree with their politics, then likely we are not going to agree with the policy that they set. And some of that recruiting, some of that to, to be to be looking at at the opportunities and saying, hey, there, there's people here that are, you know, maybe on some boards uh, or, or maybe have been appointed to some positions or are working in various ways. We think, well, this person could do that job. Yeah. And, and I think it's identifying, um, identifying potential candidates mm-hmm. and and making sure that, you know, this is this is going to be somebody who I would trust to represent me. Mm-hmm. Values. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Well, speaking of values, you 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 talk about your your fiscally conservative values, um, and which which I, I think is is great. Um, and I, I mean that certainly has been more of a of a. And again, I, I know these are nonpartisan positions, but that's certainly been more of a conservative talking point. Mm-hmm. You know, fiscal responsibility. Um, but you know, you embrace that along with a lot of your more progressive leanings. I think on the social end of the spectrum. So, you know, talk a little bit about how you came to to your, and I think probably through your experiences on boards and things, where you came to 
understanding how to keep budgets tight and, and what the importance of that is. Right. And, and I think that this developed a lot more through my time on the city council. Mm -hmm. um, like I described before, it was shocking when we got the first real comprehensive budget. Mm -hmm. And um, and one of the things that the that the city council did first was we set priorities and we made a plan for how we were going to, you know, pay down the deficit and then begin to build emergency reserves. And initially we had set percentages and we had said like X percent of funds that are not, you know, allocated to something or one-time funds, well, X percent will go to this and X percent will go to that. And then the decision was made that we didn't want to have specific numbers because we would be tied to, I really liked the idea of having a very specific, um, you know, it, it's fine to have, you know, a 10% maybe that we could go in either direction. But I've, I've really felt like, yeah, this is, this is what we need to do in order to close this gap. And I remember the vote that just kind of, I, I was so frustrated with it, was we have so much deferred maintenance, so much. There are so many different projects that are, that need to be fixed and they need to be upkept and they need, you know, things like that. And we had these one-time funds that were not restricted and the, the council was deciding what to do with them. And, you know, and I kept saying, well, we said that every dollar that we, you know, we're going to do this. And um, but there was this report from the park director talking about Sycamore Pool and how we had this deferred maintenance project and we needed to do it. And I thought, well, why are we just hearing from the park director? Right. Like I want to hear about the deferred maintenance project with the trees mm -hmm. and I want to hear about the deferred maintenance projects with the roads and. Right. So to me, I didn't understand why just the park director got to put in his staff report. And then the council voted 6-1 with me as the dissenting vote to put, you know, and it wasn't a huge amount of money. It was like $40,000 or $50,000 towards deferred maintenance on Sycamore Pool. And I just said, no, this is not what we said we were going to do. And if we're not going to follow what we said we're going to do, then we need to give every deferred maintenance project the same opportunity to access those funds, right? Because there might be one that's a more critical need. And so I think that, I think it was through the process of setting the new budget policies that I became more and more kind of, um, more of a watchdog on it. And, uh, and it was funny because there was somebody, um, a very conservative individual who was frequently in the, in the audience. Mm -hmm. And we would very frequently have the same questions about the budget. And, um, and it, you know, it kind of became funny because, you know, I'd say, well, I, I had a question about page five on this or, you know. It's and... possible that person has been on this show. <laughs> <laughs> do you think so? <laughs> yeah, yes, I do. But Tammy, Tammy you, you know, that's when I thought, oh, you know, well, Tammy's, you know, she's a little softer as far as that stuff goes. You were not. I know. You were not. <laughs> you closed libraries. Yeah. <laughs> but those are the I tough didn't decisions. I didn't close libraries. You I you know, just said this is a county responsibility. Yeah. And and the contract, so I went back. You were tough up there. Yeah. I pulled I pulled all of the contracts from the first contract between the city and the county. And I read through every single one and I took pictures of them all because I wanted to understand. And those first contracts were signed at a time when the county was in trouble and the city was flush, right? And it started at whatever it was, 85,000, and then it grew to 100,000, then it went to 125,000. But during that time, no one was looking at, well, okay, the budgets of both of these organizations have changed, right? The county budget has come and has now come back up. It's now flush. And now the city is in trouble. And so, so the original contracts we had, didn't, they didn't make sense anymore. And so as a county service, um, considering what we were facing as a city, you know, I, I, I felt like I had to say, no, we can't fund this at the level we've been funding it. And so, you know, my motions for funding at $25,000 were shot down. And, um, I, you know, I think I ended up voting for at a higher level, but. Um, and you impressed Loretta Torres. That's 
<laughs> Full that's, disclosure. That's something, yeah. Lorette has been on the show. You're right. Yeah, she, we love that, her. That wasn't who. We, that wasn't. It wasn't who it was. Who was no, okay. It well, was, but it was somebody who. She I was sat thinking with about her, and we love we love Loretta Torres. And, <laughs> that's right. And all that's the right. people that go to the meetings, you know, and are are so engaged. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's a, that's a critical part, I and mean, that's what one of the great things about this community is you do have people that are really super engaged. On both ends of the spectrum, mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. know, and, and attend meetings and, and comment and, and hold feet to the fire. Right. You know, I mean, you, you appreciate that, I'm sure, as, a, as I an do. elected official. I do. And I would always say, like, um, you know, Michael Riley would be there a number of times and he would speak to issues and I'd say, ah, darn it, I agree with Michael Riley again, you know. And, <laughs> um, and he's somebody who I like to talk to about issues because he is very conservative. And, you know, I think he, he like me, sees – us on, on opposite ends of the political spectrum, but um, but there's a reasonableness there and there's a, an objectivity um, that I think both of us appreciate. That's so great. I mean, because I mean, the, the one thing I hate from both ends of the spectrum is the echo chamber. Yeah. And it's so easy to fall into it because, I mean, everybody likes the confirmation bias of, well, see, you know, that piece of media <laughs> or whatever confirms what I thought because they're saying it too, Fox News or CNN right. or whatever it is. Um, but I mean, when you... We're all people. I mean, I think it's it's so easy to demonize. You know, people aren't enemies or maybe you're adversaries in the political process because mm-hmm. you're trying to reach an end that you can all agree on. But, you know, when you demonize each other, you don't get anywhere. I mean, and we, yep. we're seeing that a lot in, yep. in Washington, Sacramento, and even even on the local scene a little bit. You're seeing a lot of gridlock. Yep. And people don't like it. I don't like it. I mean, as, as a voter, I mean, I want to see people who can make deals. I want to see people <laughs> who, can, who can work across the aisle and can mm-hmm. shake hands and give a little, get a little, and make a deal. Right. I really don't like seeing speakers have their three minutes and be put in handcuffs and, and <laughs> walked out. <laughs> um, and I, I've I've been to the city council meetings and I've been to the supervisor meetings mm-hmm. and the supervisor meetings, they get irate. Like mm-hmm. they get upset, especially some groups that are advocating for certain things. So I, I uh, Recently, a, a person spoke uh, at city council in Chico and, and, and was, you know, hauled off for being disorderly, although I think the council should have a little thicker skin because, like I said, the county supervisor meetings, there is a lot of passion. And, uh-huh. you know, people want to display that passion when they have their three minutes to speak. Mm-hmm. And, you mm-hmm. know, to be out of order, or to be something like that. Maybe, but I mean, have some thicker skin and give some people some you know time to speak. I think as long as no one's threatening, yeah, we're, and if, we're okay. <laughs> just, you know, if they're demonizing on one side and the other side comes up and kind of is critical of the demonizing, and maybe is you know, maybe uh, I think it was uncalled. It it's, it, it never happened before. Yeah. I think. So. Well, like I said, it's a messy process, but out of that, in the theory is that you, you come to consensus and you, you're able to be governed. Well, I think it, it might come to be a learning experience yeah, for the city. I, I don't yeah. know. You know, yeah. ho- hopefully it will, and maybe they will find some some, some, some rationale yeah. in there to figure out. Yeah. Well, Tammy, let me ask you about this. I kind of alluded to it earlier. Um, talk about the experience of, of running as a woman and as a mom here in this this cycle. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, you've been you've been at this for for a bit of time. This isn't your first rodeo, as they say. <laughs> you've been doing this for a little bit. Um, but how do you feel about so, seeing so many of your sisters get out there and 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 throw their hat in the ring for the first time? There's so much energy mm-hmm. um, in this and in this Me Too moment as well that we're having. There's so many of these, you know. I don't want it to be divisive with male female, but you feel this energy from females, from women, on that end of the of the of any of any of any uh, race, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. How do you feel about it? I mean, how do you look at it as somebody again who's 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 a veteran of this experience? How do you look at women who are coming into this for the first time? And what would you say to those women who are doing this now? Well, I mean, the women that I have been running with, you know, in this election, I, I mean, they're all amazing. They're, mm-hmm. you know, it's like the most inspirational um, group of of people that you know. I think we'd be very lucky to have any or all of them um, representing us. And, you know, I ha- this isn't the first race where I've been, you know, I've, I've run with, um, with Ann Schwab mm-hmm. and, you know, and served with, you know, Renette as well. And so, you know, it's to me, it's not new, you know, in 2014, um, Lupe Aramla and Fru Molina ran. And so, um, you know, I, I think that, I think that it has been there 
And I think that it's just kind of being noticed this year because we happen to have three female candidates um, in the C- in the CD1 race. Mm-hmm. And um, But I mean, I love it. I love seeing it. I love hearing all of them speak. I love, um, yeah, just... <laughs> It's, and it's that's a ins- good thing. It's inspiring. I mean, uh, you know, it, th- there is a difference. I mean, you know, not to, not to draw stereotypes, but there is a difference when you hear a woman, you know, addressing an audience, and there and there's just there's a difference. I mean, there and, and of course there's men and there's women. I mean, there's there's differences <laughs> in us, right? But I mean, you can see that a woman has generally has more of an inclusive. Generally, I don't want to be you know it'd be too stereotypical, but generally has more of a broader inclusivity uh, in the in the way they approach issues and the way the things they look about that they look at when they're considering positions and I like that I mean mm-hmm. I, I know I like that I mean men and I know this because I'm a man and I tend to do this will tend to clamp down a, a lot on well no this is what I believe is right this is mm-hmm. what I know and this is what I'm gonna do and mm-hmm. I'm not going to be sure and there's some some virtue to that but in the political sense, it's not necessarily a virtue to have that such a such a clamping down of a of a belief system. Yeah. So I, I mean that could be true, and I'm not. I don't. You know, I don't know because I'm. I don't know that I've studied. You know, the human nature and the differences between the genders. Mm-hmm. But what I can tell you is, it's still, it's still unusual for a woman to be running for office, mm-hmm. even though we're seeing so many people. Um, I think, Aaron. I think I told you about this that when I. When I went to file my papers, the first sheet that you're filling out, it was says, and he shall, and the, and the <laughs> candidate he will, and you know, and I'm just circling all the he's, and I thought, okay, this is the first thing I'm going to do when I'm yeah, elected, yeah. you know, I'm going to change this. For me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because we have not changed the actual form yeah. for them to file. <laughs> and so That's he will be running. That's yeah, crazy. He, his campaign and. And I've had a number of experiences, and I don't know if it's just that I'm paying attention to it more this time through, um, you know, because my first run um, at, at council, I, I had a three-month-old baby, and I wasn't necessarily um, paying attention to, mm-hmm. to all of those kinds of things. But I had one meeting with a former CEO of Butte County um, who felt it was appropriate and, um, you know, acceptable for him to comment on my body. Mm. Um Last night at a forum, I had someone um, grab my hand so hard that I thought, uh, wow, like I was literally yeah. stuck while he insulted me and told me to go back to where I came from and that my type wasn't wanted here. Oh my and, gosh. Yeah. And fist bump. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that'll, that'll learn me for extending <laughs> my hand to someone, right? And I thought, wow, this is. this is not something that male candidates have to deal with as far as I know. Um, but this is still very much the reality for for a woman. That's interesting to you know we had Delaine Easton on the show and you know she's fifty you know forty fifty year history of public you know mm-hmm. service and you know what you guys can speak to a lot to those candidates who are running those women that are running that you know these are possibly the things that you're going to encounter um, but really the the unrepresentation of the underrepresentation mm-hmm. of women. I mean, what is there? It's a five county, the county board is five. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. And Four men, one, one women. Yeah. I don't know if that really represents the, <laughs> no. you know, the population. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Uh, you women need two and a half women. <laughs> yes. The, the women get the one vote and the men get the four and that's the way things are going to be. I don't really think that is how uh, we live anymore in our, in our, in our homes. And I don't think that's how we should live in our society. I think there should be, I think women are underrepresented. And like to your point, I think when there is boards, committees, commissions, whatever, that uh, uh, elected uh, bodies that are more represented uh, equally by by things, I think the results are better because you have those voices. Well, I think, I mean, and in a couple minutes we have left here, I I, I mean, this is what I'm thinking about as we're having this conversation is I, I think this very conversation is showing that we're not there. We're not where we need to be. I mean, right. these, these should be issues that we shouldn't even be talking about. Right. It shouldn't even be something that we're like, well, what does it feel like to be a woman? And, I mean, it's just right. like, what does it feel like to be a person? Right. You know, that's Nobody the stuff asks about. what it feels like to be a man in politics. Yeah, right. Like- <laughs> exactly. exactly. I, I was told, I was, at, I was told at uh, Tehama, in Tehama County, uh, why should I vote for this candidate over a woman? So I, you know, I walked away from that of kind of, well, well, you know, so not that I could ever say, okay, oh, whoa. 
Whoa, okay. <laughs> you could, you to. <laughs> you know, I'm sure we have hundreds and hundreds of years to make up for for <laughs> the losses we've created. But but um yeah, you, you know, I can see how um things have been taken from our side so much to where, you yeah. know, well, we, I we, was offended a little bit, and I have no reason to be offended for what <laughs> the history of, of things. Well, I mean, for instance, I mean, and I'm not, there's no equivalency here, but just as another another data point, I mean, we had we had Gregory Cheadle on the show uh, in, in yes, an episode. Yeah. And, great, and, great point. you know, we're, we're talking about the fact that, you know, we're still talking about race issues. Uh-huh. You know, we're still having discussions about, well, what does it mean to be a black man and have this, these 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 experiences in America today and, and has it changed and, or hasn't it changed or why? Has it, I mean, until we are not having those conversations right. at all, we're, we haven't really gotten to where we need to get exactly. as, a, as a society. Um, and I think many of us feel that way, but yet there's still, those biases are still in our minds. Mm-hmm. So what, what, the last word, how do you think we should get get through that stuff? Can we get through that stuff at this point? Yeah, we can and we have to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> and I think, have, yeah. yeah, I think that, um, I mean, I think we still have to be having those conversations, particularly around race, um, because because things haven't changed. And all you have to do is turn on the TV or turn on the radio to see that it hasn't changed. And I think that if we try to fool ourselves into thinking how much progress we've made and how far we've come, um, then we're not looking, we're not looking at the reality and, you yeah. know, we have to do better. Yeah, yeah, we do. <laughs> no, I, I, no doubt about it. Well, June 5th is the day, yes. uh, all, everyone out there should know June 5th is the day to get out and vote. Um, or you to know, send in your vote by your, mail your, your, before then. That's right. Before that date. Uh, Make very, sure you have enough postage on it. Yeah. Very important. You know, I mean, <laughs> it's still a lot of people just think that, well, you know, I don't have to worry about it till November. No. <laughs> I mean, we need to vote yes, on June 5th. Do. So everyone out there should really understand that yeah. uh, and, and, and take care to do that. So thanks, Tammy Ritter, for joining us today on the show. Um, really great, great job. Really great to get to know you a little bit and, and hear your positions on stuff. I think our, our listeners appreciated that too. So that's our show for today. And again, thanks to Tammy Ritter for joining us. And don't forget, NorCal News Now is available wherever you download your podcast. So check us out and subscribe. We can also be found on Facebook at NorCal News Now, where you can post your comments and suggestions for upcoming pod- podcast topics and guests. So thanks to all of you for listening in. We'll be back at you soon with another episode of NorCal News Now. So long.